I'm Jason Hine. Uh, I am the director of uh, delivery for Early Information Science. We, I live in Seattle. Uh, we have offices all over the country, so I'm, I'm one of those full-time remote workers. Um, I'm not from Seattle originally. I grew up in the Upper Midwest in Minnesota. Uh, those of you who uh, listen to Prairie Home Companion, uh, you already know my entire life. Uh, we, because I lived in a small town, we did not have a lot of entertainment choices. So the playground, my playground in elementary school, one of the uh, playground devices that we had was literally three metal poles stuck into the ground. And the way we were supposed to use them was you grabbed onto them with your hand and you just ran around in a circle. That was supposed to be our idea of fun. So needless to say, we didn't use them a whole lot uh, because we knew what tetanus was and we were afraid of it. So what, I, what you see here up in front of you is a game that we played a lot. It was a game called Kill the Man with the Ball. And, and what it was is it was basically anywhere between five and 75 kids um, where the objective was there was a football, an American football, and one person just threw it and caught it, and that person's job was to run away from the other four to 74 people until that pack raced, took that kid down and tackled them bodily to the ground. That was really the only rule. Now, as you can imagine, as you grow up, you know, this, this game is incredibly simple. It's a game with like almost no rules. You know, and because it has no rules, what happens? Well, usually the biggest kid, the fastest kid, the kid who is able to, you know, those, those kids that have those advantages end up winning all of the time. It also makes for a really, really boring game to watch. Nobody wants to watch a bunch of elementary school kids play Kill the Man with the Ball. And yet, millions of people sit down every Sunday to watch 22 people do a game that is highly similar, right? It's like there's a ball, you, you get, you know, the big difference is you can actually give it to other people. But the biggest difference between football, American football, and kill the man with the ball, the NFL rule book contains 85 pages of rules that determine what is good play, what is bad play. What is the right way to play? What is the wrong way to play? And it creates a set of constraints and a set of shared expectations for us as fans so that we know or we think we know what's happening down on the field. The NFL makes billions of dollars off of those 85 pages of rules. All of the kids across America playing kill the man with the ball make no money with their one rule. So what's the takeaway from this? We are in the track that's talking about the foundations for digital success. And what I'm going to talk about today is this concept of a rule book for product content. Now, most of the work that I do uh, with, with the companies that I work with, uh, it's actually been really educational. This is my first time at KM World um, to see all the different fields that people are coming from. Uh, most of the people that I work with are people who are either uh, maybe brand new to digital in general. A lot of them are selling, are focused on selling product for e-commerce. So a lot of the language that I use here focuses on products. But if you are in a, a nonprofit organization, just take the word product and substitute it for mission or service. It's all this. The presentation is designed to be very flexible. So we're going to talk about product content rule books today. How do you decide? rules that determine the content that you're managing within your KM program. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about a scorecard that I use to evaluate the content that is being managed. It's, a, it's very simple. Uh, it's something that's easily walked through with senior leadership who maybe aren't taxonomists, aren't KM experts. And then we'll talk about this, this concept that I've, I've recently been introduced to about complexity. In, in the marketplace. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is and how these rule books can help you manage it. Everybody excited? Yay! I can talk to my boss who doesn't understand KM. <clears throat> so 
Let's start with just the basics. What is a content rule book? They are essentially a collection of tools. It's a toolkit that you can use to document the details about what it is, what are the objects that you are managing in your system, whether those are products, services, uh, the mission you're doing. And these tools are things that exist to capture, document, institutionalize those details, that tribal knowledge of the things, the services that your firm is responsible for selling or doing or managing. But it has to go a little bit beyond that. It has to go beyond just the what it is, what it is because users of your systems and tools care about more than just what it is. They want to know how the things that you manage are grouped, how they are defined, how they are related to each other, how they are described. And if some of these sound familiar, this will start to get to a little more familiar. Yes, some of the things that we do as KM professionals, when you use the technical lingo like taxonomy, remember most of the people out there in the world don't know what taxonomy is. I go into clients who still ask me, why am I talking about stuffing squirrels? It, it, I, you laugh, but there are a lot of people who don't know what taxonomy is, who don't know what an attribution schema is. So when I'm talking to folks like that, it's very important that we break this down and make sure that they understand when we talk about how their products are grouped, hey, that's, that's where taxonomy can come in. How your products are defined. How do you tell the difference between one product and another? That's attribution. How your products relate to each other. Are these related products? Are they required? You have to buy one to sell the other. Um, it does one lead to the other? Is it replacement products? That's relationships. And then finally, enrichments. When I use the term enrichments, I'm talking about the storytelling. I'm talking about things like copy and text and images and video and all of the things that a lot of people typically house within a dam. Those are sort of the four basic components that I work with with most of my clients. Obviously, you know, it, it, the list can go on, but I only have 45 minutes. So taxonomy, it's really important when you're, just, when you're describing this to people who aren't taxonomists, and the analogy that I found most useful is it's going to the grocery store. So when you walk into the grocery store, the person has the thing that they're looking for, but the signs up above the various parts of the store don't say Lunchables. They, say, they don't say Honey Nut Cheerios. It's breakfast, it's snacks, it's dairy, it's meat. And the goal of that signage, that wayfinding, is to get the users from the door where they are exposed to everything, to the thing that they are most interested in. And you translate that into a taxonomy. Right? You think of this as just sort of the, a series of waypoints to get any user from the start of your experience to specific types of things that they are looking for. That's really fundamentally all a taxonomy is. Now obviously, Many of you in this room are professionals, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. But when I'm talking about, uh, again, when you're communicating with people who aren't experts, the whole concept of mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, the whole MISI principle, I always liken that to, well, it's a place for everything and everything in its place. It is uh, both obviously very important. Those are also the, the, the concepts that I've found most success at getting non-experts to understand. Uh, I talk about making the families a reasonable size. I, I work with a lot of clients who their existing taxonomy has, oh, 50 different child nodes under a given parent. And we talk about why that's a problem. We talk about the tyranny of choice. Um, and then obviously classifying two terminal nodes. Again, we're not going to spend much time here. Uh, obviously, what's in a taxonomy? The list. You need to know what the categories are. You want to know how they relate to each other. There's the hierarchy. And then this is the critical one. It's very easy for an organization to sit down with the product experts that they have and create a taxonomy and get everybody to sign off on it. But what ends up happening is other people who weren't involved in the design start to interact with the taxonomy. 
And if they don't have very clear definitions for this is what is supposed to go in this node, then users just start to make their own assumptions. So a good example is when I used to work at Amazon, I did a lot of work with our taxonomy browse team, and we would create all kinds of nodes for you know um, twist drill bits or uh, automotive accessories, right? Those sort of junk drawer nodes that invariably filter into any any taxonomy. And because and that was really the only information that third party sellers had to interact. So when they were trying to classify their product to the Amazon taxonomy, it, if all that they have is the node name and no metadata on what it's supposed to be for, you end up with a lot of noise. I'm sure everybody in this room who has ever shopped on Amazon has been browsing through selection and then suddenly, you know, you're like looking at, uh, you're looking at baseball bats and then suddenly there's a KitchenAid mixer in your results. That's because it's been misclassified. Um, probably because the node name is a little vague. So when you're designing your taxonomy, that metadata of defining the definitions is obviously, that's what's capturing the intent. What do you want that node to be used for? If you let outsiders make that decision for you, you're probably going to suffer in the long term. Now attribution, all right, this is, this is how you compare things. Now in the old brick and mortar world, when you walked into the grocery store, you found your way to the breakfast cereal aisle and how did you make a decision? You would pick up one and you'd pick up the other and you'd look at them. And there's a lot of things about products that you, that you sort of observe that are tangible. Like how heavy is this? How big is it? Is it a, is it what color? What is it made from? There's all these sort of things that when you pick up like a tool at a Home Depot or some hose that you can, in, that you can understand without consciously thinking about it. And the hard thing in digital is that those physical comparisons, those sort of things that you can just infer because you're handling it, suddenly aren't possible. So when you're thinking about all of the different features to account for in a, an attribution part of your model, you have to take those implicit characteristics and make them explicit. You have to create attributes to capture these concepts that, that ordinarily you just would have thought about by handling it. So let's look at, well, here's all the, the details. Obviously metadata is really important, so here's the end node. This is for shower doors. These are all attributes that we have done work with that apply to shower doors. There's probably uh, 30, 25 to 30 different attributes here. You give them sample values. What type of data is it? Is it text? Is it Boolean? Is it a number? Navigation order. Uh, this is one that in, a, in this particular example, this was for a company that was doing data for an e-commerce site. So they wanted to know what was the priority of these attributes for use in a faceted search. So we gave that to them. And then again, the definition. So just like with taxonomy nodes, giving a definition for what you think this attribute should be for is critical for people who are gonna supply you that data or take that data from you and put it into their own experience. So the, the, the killer here is when you have an attribute like style or type, those types of attributes can become pretty troublesome because what you think of as style and what they, your maybe a channel partner thinks of as type are not always the same thing. So, now, attributes uh, are really nice because they can, they can stretch quite a bit. The way that you use attributes. So one of the things that I, a lot of the clients that I work with are in sort of the industrial B2B space. They have very strange attributes to capture some of those implicit characteristics. So one of my favorites is short, it's, a, it's, a, it's hardness. So it's how, basically how squishy is something. And they, the industry has invented this, uh, this scale called the Shore scale of hardness. And there's actually three scales, Shore double O, Shore A, and Shore D. 
And depending on the, sh the shore range, it runs, so shore 00 is designed to measure things that are really, really soft, like marshmallows and gel insoles and mouse pads. So you're able to kind of, this is an example of how you can take those implicit characteristics, right? Yes, we could actually have a, a, an attribute in our data model called squishiness, and the values could be very squishy, mildly squishy, uh, medium squishy, but that's not terribly practical. So what this, what this shows is ways in which you can kind of create your own units or go out and look to see are there units in the marketplace that you can use to make this something that's even numerical. Hey, great, smartwatch band. It's a 70 on the shore A, but it's only maybe a 13 on the shore D. So, but the goal is to try to create a universal language, universal set of tools that both you as the manager of your KM program and the users who are gonna be participating in your program can agree on to try to eliminate any sort of subjectivity from that work. Does that make sense? So we talked about this a little bit. So you have your list of attributes, the names, the metadata, type sample values, uh, rankings, and then again, critically, definitions. So <clears throat> we've talked about kind of the two big ones. We talked about taxonomy, talked about attribution. Uh, there are other relationships and enrichments we're not going to get to in, in this conversation. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards if you want to try to just, if that's a particular issue for your concern. And the reason is because there is a scale here, a scale of subjectivity. So some of these product rulebook components are, pretty, are less subjective than others. The decision about, it's generally fairly easy to get the managers of your program and the users of your program to agree on what should the taxonomy look like, what should attribution look like, than it is to get people to agree on relationships and enrichments. And, um, and so now let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about that because that's a really important part of looking at the library that you're managing and to say, is, is, what, is this working? <clears throat> because you have, you're going to get asked by your leadership, by your managers, all right, hey, great, you've got a taxonomy, you've got attribution, you've got some rules on, uh, you know, on enrichments and, and relationships. How's it doing? Is, it any good? is what you're doing any good? And that generally f kind of falls into a little bit more of a sophisticated question. It's really about do the users, the people that are interacting with my content, think that my content is any good? That's not a simple question, and it's not even a single question. Like, who is your user? What is the content? We've talked about four different kinds already. What, what is good? How do you define what good is? And then even the question of, well, what is mine? The content that we manage in our programs, the knowledge that we manage is not all of our own making. Like sometimes it's information that we get from articles or third parties or, or consultants that provide it for us. So a lot of firms, when they start into trying to think about knowledge management, they try to think about a digital transformation, they don't think about all four of those components. And that's really important. Because in order to measure how effective the content is that is underlying your entire KM program, that's feeding into the training set of data for your AI, that's feeding into your search, you have to measure your performance across all four of those dimensions, right? So this is a, a, a very simple approach that I've used with clients to kind of start getting some of this, to start breaking this down, because it's a complex problem. And it's just a simple Excel spreadsheet. I'm more than happy to, if any of you are interested, I'm happy to email it to you. Uh, it's just a simple base, just you know, give me a business card afterwards and I'll, I'll email it over. Um, but it's really about thinking about the different components in terms of what I call the four C's of content. If you want to evaluate if your content is any good, 
Well, you have to ask yourself, is, the, is it correct? Right? Is it the right content? Is it complete? Do I have all the content that my users need to make a decision? Is it consistent? Right? Do we have it across all of the different uh, objects that we're managing? Are we using the same terminology? Are we using the same verbiage? And then lastly, is it clear? So clarity is, is I find the most interesting one because it's somewhat subjective. So, and just like the different types of content are less or more subjective, the C's are also less subjective and more subjective. It's generally fairly easy to ascertain if the content you're managing is correct. Is it correct? Yes or no. It either is or it isn't. But is your content clear? Well, that's fairly dependent on who the customer is. Right? I, have some, I have some users who are, trade, who are tradesmen who know everything about the products that I'm talking about. But I also have, uh, sometimes it's just the, the person who works in purchasing. It's, it's an administrative person who doesn't know anything about it, but still needs to be able to get access and find it and to feel like they know what they're doing. We all like to feel like we know what we're doing. I do. Um, so what you do in each of these sections, for each of these components, you have this little checklist. Well, is it correct? And who is it? So this is your who is the user. Is it an internal user, an internal expert? Is it an external expert, somebody who really who knows the product, but maybe you know, not as well as your internal people? Obviously, your internal people should probably always know more about what you are offering, what you are managing in your KM program. And then you have your external novice, somebody who doesn't know anything about it. And you know, taxonomy is one where you know, in it's just kind of a, it's a checklist are the terms that I'm using in my taxonomy understandable by an internal? Are the names of my nodes, can my internal people understand it? Can the relationship between the sibling nodes, does it make sense for somebody who's an internal user, so who's really knowledgeable about it? That's a different phase of maturity than if I've thought about it for an external novice. Same thing happens with attribution. Are the values, you know, honestly, the, the correct for attribution is generally fairly simple um, because it's either it either is or it isn't. But when you get to clarity, the terms that you use to describe the values for a particular attribute, if, especially if you work in an industry that has a lot of trade jargon in it, those of you working in the medical community, those of you who work in pharma, those of you who work in like um, maybe exotic financial services, like there's a lot of trade jargon that happens in that language. And so this section of clarity can be really informative. Now, how do you fill this out? What I do is I generally say, what's the percentage of my content, what's the percentage of my attribution that I think is clear to an internal expert, ex in external expert or external office? Sometimes companies have data and tools that they can use to assess this. Other times, this is a back of the envelope gut feeling that I work with with product managers. This scorecard is designed to let you decide how you want to measure that. As long as you write it down and maintain it, it can work either way. Um, let's see. Um, completeness, a lot of times, this is for, so for attribution, this is fill rate. Completeness for taxonomy is collectively exhaustive. Do we have Specific nodes, not junk drawer nodes, like other miscellaneous, other blank, you know, those, those things that are the thorn in our side of anybody who works in taxonomy. Um, having a lot of those and not having specific nodes for the products you carry is obviously a problem. So again, it's measured in terms of percentages. What's the percentage of our taxonomy that we feel is uh, do we, are we not able to classify SKUs to or services to? Again, some, some companies have tools that can, that can help you uh, report on that. Sometimes it's just you have to talk to your product managers. So once you have all of that 
done, then the next challenge is ownership, right? Do users think my content is any good? This is where a lot of organizations will start spinning their wheels. When I first started working at Amazon, I was on the team that started up what is now Amazon Business. And, and we had to, we had this, this goal. We were going to create original content, original copy, original images for every SKU that we loaded. And we built a process. To, we had our own photo studios. We had our own team of 30 copywriters we built out. I had a, I had a budget in seven figures to go out and, and, and launch this program. That program does not exist anymore. Why? Because what we learned is we were trying to boil the ocean. And it's one thing to create original content on the products you sell when you are loading you know, 50,000 SKUs a month than when you're loading 500,000 SKUs a month. We simply couldn't keep up. So what we had to do was we had to kind of look at it by, we had to create a method of prioritizing the objects we were concerned with. So some products for us were the products that were driving our business, right? They were the top 5%. They were, they were the, 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 the products that brought a ton of traffic, sold a lot. Um, and what we did is we have this sort of scale here of who is the owner of that content? Is this an open standard? Right, is this UNSPSC code? Is this, uh, is this harmonized number? Is it, um, is it a uh, content we're getting directly from the source, from the manufacturer? They will provide it to anybody who, who asks for it. That's typically where you start because that's the easiest to get a hold of. It's the least expensive. Usually suppliers are willing to give that to you freely or it's uh, something that can scale very quickly if you're trying to load a lot of product, a lot of objects into your system very quickly. A shared standard is, is there are tools that, are, there are organizations that provide kind of sets of data, kind of prepackaged what are called data pools or content pools that you can subscribe to, where anybody who subscribes to that service gets the same content. All right, that's better. There's usually some degree of curation, some degree of differentiation, but it's still a shared standard. It's still products that anybody who subscribes to can go and get. So it makes it a little hard for you to differentiate what you're carrying from other people. A partner exclusive source is when you contract with a third party to produce the content for you. So there are organizations out there that will write copy, that will take images, that's great. And they will create that just for you, for your products. But the challenge is they are still people who can get hired by competitors. If you're in the, uh, if you're in the distribution space, they can get hired by uh, other, uh, other firms and take, you know, who take up their capacity. You don't have exclusive control of their resources. So it's, again, better than the open standard. And then finally, the original is where you have your marketing team who's working with your product experts, your topic experts, your object experts to create and publish that content. Now generally, within one of these, within one of these um, circles, you'll find your, your, your priority, you wanna skew this, again, these are measurement in percentages. You want this here to be the higher number. Original content is expensive. It costs a lot of money to take your own images, to hire your own writers, especially to do it in ways that are optimized for digital. So you want to do that on the SKUs that are most important, your priority SKU, your priority uh, products, your 80-20, right, that 20% that of, your, of, your, um, of your goods and services that attracts 80% of the traffic or the use. Uh, then there's the last two categories are the ones that you manage. So these are things that are in your catalog. Yes, you're working with them. You buy them. You sell them. They're in your, maybe they're in your warehouse. Maybe they're in your library. But um, they're not terribly popular. And then finally, the long tail is that part of your portfolio 
that, yes, you know it's out there, but nobody's really interacting with it. So we're just going to create a baseline and let the data tell us when to invest in that. So you try to, so in general, you find high, you want to find high, higher numbers up here, higher percentages, and higher percentages down here. If you're spending, if you're using an open source, an open owned set of content and metadata on your priority SKUs, you're probably missing an opportunity because original content helps to drive search, helps to drive effectiveness and discovery. And by the same token, if you are investing, as I did at Amazon, where I was trying to create original content for the long tail, I'm spending a lot of money that's not going to get a return. And that's generally not going to be something that your owners, your the, the C-level folks, the folks who aren't necessarily conversant about KM, are going to be excited about. Does this kind of make sense? We'll have, we'll have plenty of time for questions. I'm pretty sure we're doing OK. OK. So once you have your rule books in place, there's a couple of things that you want to kind of think about. So just having the rule books doesn't necessarily mean you've solved all the problems, right? Right, you have to kind of keep them current as your portfolio of goods and services evolves over time. You are going to get new products that are coming. To, you are going to start offering new services. You are going to have new programs you're going to launch. You have to make sure that all of your rulebook components are staying current. The moment you stop keeping them dynamic, stop keeping them current, stop keeping them alive, people stop participating, people stop using them. You have to maintain the compliance of your SKU, the actual data that you are tracking for each of those components of your portfolio, you have to, this is where governance comes in. You have to make sure that the values that you have for each of those product data rulebook components are current. And, and this is actually really, really hard. Before I worked at Amazon, I worked for an um, industrial distributor out of Chicago who managed a catalog of products. They, had, they were a 100-plus-year-old company. They had been doing this, maintaining accuracy on the, the value of the SKUs that they carried for 100 years. And we would still, every year, find things that were wrong. Because things change. You want to match where you're optimizing and where you're making investments to the metrics that show engagement. How are users interacting with your content? So when we looked at that scorecard, right? It's really important that you're using your metrics to assess, well, hey, is this product that I'm dealing with, is this a long tail? Is it managed? Is it an 80 Is it As it moves up, as more people find it, you need to start treating it differently and make sure that you're staying current with what, you, with what your scorecard and your rulebook are telling you you should be doing. You also have to constantly be balancing the perspectives that you and your team bring to your selection and be balancing that with what's going on in the marketplace. Most of us, I'm going to guess, unless you're really lucky, uh, don't work for a monopoly where everything that you do becomes the world. So there is that balance of, yes, you want to be inwardly looking, but you don't want to obsess about it to the point where you forget what else is going out there because you need to the last thing you want to do is have a, a bunch of new objects about to come into your KM model, and you don't have the rule books ready. It's generally much better to have the rule books ready up front. And finally, most of us in our organizations don't work in an ivory tower. We have to share our content, share our knowledge, share our, uh, our content with other people, other organizations, channel partners. The easier it is, for me to simply give my KM rule books to a supplier, to a client, to a marketplace in a way that smoothly takes my content and translates it into the way that they want to use it, right? because we don't want to be the only ones who have a rule book. We want our channel partners to have rule books, we, because that makes it easier for us to syndicate our content to our partners. But just like our rule books are always going to be evolving, our partners' rule books are always going to be evolving. So we want to try and stay, we need to stay in constant communication with channel partners to make sure that those, those mappings, those relationships stay current. 
So I was thinking about this, and I was reading a book. Um, this is a, a book that came out fairly recently by a guy by the name of Rick Nason. And, and it really kind of opened a lot of eyes. Well, opened my eyes. Um, because what he talks about is this concept of complicated problems versus complex problems. And complex problems are, are, are kind of the, the, the new way of thinking about it. Historically, when we as knowledge managers have been trying to wrap our hands around the fact that a lot of the knowledge we're trying to manage is, is, is hard, we talk about it because it's complicated, but we've, we've been thinking about it like there's a lot, there's just a lot going on here. And we just, we just need to like create the right algorithms. We just need to like use AI. We just need to use a lot of really powerful computing and we can, we can control this. That is a complicated way of thinking. But in reality, what Mr. Nason talks about is there are certain problems, a lot of the problems that we are dealing with in knowledge management right now, which are actually complex, which means you cannot predict every single component using an algorithm. The inputs are not always the same. Actually, if the inputs are the same, the outputs can vary because of there's just uncontrolled things that you have to manage. So just for an example, well, so yeah, so when you're talking about content strategies, when I'm talking about it with my clients, I always reinforce to them that the strategy itself, the big picture is by nature complex. The individual components that we've been talking about so far as the product data rulebook components are complicated. And that's why they're so important. So here, let's just kind of take a look at this, this graphic for a minute. At first, this looks kind of overwhelming. This is like, oh man, there's a lot going on here. But when you break it down, this is a complicated problem. This is a nut, it's a hex nut. It's got a material, a size, a thread type. Okay, yep, I know what that's, it's, it's, it's tightened to a certain degree of torque. Got it, I've controlled everything about that nut. This is a bevel gear. All right, so I know the number of teeth, I know the diameter, I know what it's made of. This is another bevel gear. Between the two of them, I understand the ratio of how fast this one moves will drive this one a certain speed. There is nothing in, in all of this is, is a perfect example of a complex problem. We can look at every component of this and understand how a change to that component will impact the entire machine. Now, this is a way, the way that a lot of people have thought about knowledge management for a long time, especially in senior leadership, right? Where it's like everything is a machine, right? Oh, inputs, outputs, it's, it's easily understood. But this is only complex in a very, very small area. So now when we zoom out, right, and we look at this entire big machine, it can be very tempting to say, oh, well, I understood every component of that problem. So all I have to do is bring enough people, bring enough computing power, where I can just break down every single component of this giant machine and document everything in my rule books and then my job will be done. But what's the problem with that? The problem is that this is not how, this is how the company looks at this problem right now. But this is how the customer looks at it. Users never look at our knowledge machines the same way. They are constantly looping and circling in ways that we cannot control, cannot estimate, and cannot predict. This is the concept of a complex problem. So for us as organizations who have a limited scope of resources, for us to be able to try and manage this entire monstrosity as a complicated problem is asking too much of us, of our resources, and of our budgets. And we can be much smarter if we just kind of follow where the customer is going, where the user is going, and focus resources on those areas that they are looking at the most. There's, as you know, like, there's huge parts of this machine that we're not seeing in this graphic. 
So why would we be spending a lot of money to try to clean up and organize and, and optimize the content in those areas? What I find is when I'm talking to folks at the C level, they get very excited about this concept because they're suddenly able to realize, hey, we can just do kind of like a baseline level of quality, right, to get, to get all of those content components up to that, that minimum level of quality, and then what we can do is let's just watch where the users go, and oh, hey, we're seeing a lot of people go to this part, let's optimize that, and let's spend you know, a little bit of the budget on that and measure the results, and then suddenly we can start to, it's easier for us to go to our C-level folks and say, hey, we've seen a 1,800 basis point improvement in margin or in conversion or in click-through rate. Um, that then makes it easier for us to go back and ask for more money next year because we're, go we're doing this based on actual metrics and volume and not just best practices. Make sense? All right, Jason. Well, now what? All right. Um, so content strategy is really difficult because it is a complex problem. That's the first thing you want to take away from this, that whole difference between complexity and complicated problems. So if your managers, if your leaders, if the people you need to convince are talking about it like it's complicated, the first thing you want to do is help them understand that. Uh, that difference and, and why it is, is a material problem. You want to think about the problems that you are dealing with in KM as a problem of managing problems, not solving them. So it should be about, hey, we're going to try little things, we're going to learn from those results, and we're going to adapt. You very rarely fix problems over time. The content rule books, the content rule, rule book scorecard, it's really about just carving out those variables that you can control, that you can make complicated, so that you can you know, simplify the equations that you're trying to manage. Um, segment everything that you do, and just kind of narrow your focus when, you, when you're doing this you know, try, learn, adapt philosophy. Try to do it on narrow, targeted segments, because that's where you're going to measure the results that you're going to use to make your arguments up. Uh, if you don't have an analytics program, even if it's just as something as, as simple as Google Analytics, um, you really want to do that um, in order to prioritize your work. And then lastly, this is, uh, you've probably heard this a couple of times, technology in general is about enforcing and scaling the rule books so that you can automate more of the checking I've worked with clients who thought that, oh, well, just buying a tool is going to solve my problem. In my experience, that's not, the way, that's not the way it is. In fact, if anything, having an understanding of these rule books in place before you go and talk to uh, a technology firm actually only makes your requirements gathering part that much easier. So take a look at what you have, right? Start with, if, if all you have is a taxonomy and an attribution, great, start there. Start with, start with those less complex types and then move into the more complex ones as you get more practice, as you get more data. Every try that you do is most likely to succeed if it's focused. Give yourself at least one person full time. Build out your analytics program. It's a cycle. This is content management is a program, not a project. So it has to be iterative and then watch for shifts in those complexity. Watch what your users are doing. Watch what the market is doing. Watch what regula regulators are doing. They will have an impact that you have to quickly adapt your products to. So I thought I had more time, but I think I ended just on time. Yes, you did. Feel free to connect. Love to chat with anybody afterwards. I'll be around for a while. So thank you again. <laughs>